Hello everyone! This video is something that I came up with a little over a year ago when discussing Elder Scrolls V story on live streams, on my Discord server, and other places. Much of the discussions revolved around my previous basically nothing video series called What If Skyrim Was Good. For those of you who were unaware, 99% of all artists, musicians, writers, they look back at their previous work with some level of disgust. In my previous What If Skyrim Was Good, it was a series of disjointed, half-thought-out videos full of inconsistencies. Many of those inconsistencies were due to the modular nature of those videos, coupled with the fact that I was trying to stay as close as possible to the source material of Elder Scrolls V. So while well, these days I would never do another What If Skyrim Was Good for Skyrim, I would like to do an alternative take on Skyrim, this time borrowing absolutely nothing from the original Elder Scrolls V, and instead constructing a different tale based on the Skyrim that was constructed in world building from Elder Scrolls 1 through 4, or more accurately, Elder Scrolls 1 through 3, and we'll disregard a good chunk of 4 because that was imperialist Nord culture, and not really representative of the home of the Nords. So before I get started, for those of you who are unaware, I always enjoy looking back on a series and examining the course not taken, or to better explain it, the potential of early story work that gets stripped away with each iteration. This always happens with storylines because the universe is a gigantic what-if machine. As we go forward, timelines are established, and those timelines create countless what-if scenarios. It's true in real life, and it's true in fantasy. But since fantasy isn't real, constructing a fiction about a fiction can be kind of fun. Now, this is something my brain does automatically, without conscious work. It's akin to daydreaming. It's a function of my personality. I'm not saying it's a good thing, mind you. It can cause problems for me just enjoying something for what it is. But it's automatic and there's no turning it off. The only thing I can do is not tell people about it. I could not make videos like this. But where's the profit in that? That's a question that the higher-ups in the ZeniMax family and the Bethesda Softworks Publishing would ask you if you told them you wanted to make a game that required the competency and understanding beyond that of an eight-year-old child. No, we're gonna get dungeons with animal matching. Something you could expect to see on a kid's television show. Whale, whale, snake! Yay! Sure, I'll get a litany of, make your own game, but I'm not a game designer. I'm a husband, critic, writer, former salesman, and as of right now, in the video you are watching, professional jackass. And as a professional jackass, it is my imperative to extend the proverbial middle finger and say, it's my opinion that matters. So with things like, what if Skyrim was good? They tend to flow naturally, and even after something like that is created in my head, it has a tendency to mutate, get iterated upon, change over time. It's just a side effect of me rereading this stuff and living. It gets worse when I discuss it, and in this particular community, with uh, Skyrim being remade seven or eight times, it has a tendency to be discussed a lot. And discussions regarding the Elder Scrolls, they get brought to me pretty regularly. Even when I'm playing a non-Elder Scrolls game. Which I do a lot. So, for the purposes of this video, we're first going to clear up a major misconception many casual players don't realize. I've heard this several times when discussing the material. And I'd like to, just for the purposes of this video, lead with this. So, uh, some players think that each Elder Scrolls game are hundreds of years apart. So, Skyrim is just naturally placed in their minds. This belief is held by players who've only paid attention to Skyrim. All of the other main titled games, Elder Scrolls 1 to 4, took place in Uriel Septim VII's lifetime. He's a human, by the way. 
with only the side stories taking place in alternate points in time. Side stories like Elder Scrolls Adventures Red Guard, Elder Scrolls Legends Battle Spire, and Elder Scrolls Online. In terms of eras, the fourth era begins when you complete the main quest of Elder Scrolls 4. So Elder Scrolls 4, your playtime in it, takes place in both the third and fourth eras, although you have the option to play it differently. If we attack this in the order of release, Elder Scrolls 4's main quest takes place in the third era, then Shivering Isles and Knights of the Nine take place in the fourth era. When I said I'm borrowing nothing from Elder Scrolls 5, I mean it. No time skip, no great war, no Dragon Crisis. We are setting alternate Skyrim to place two years after Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. All the Oblivion gates were closed two years ago, when Martin Septim sacrificed himself to banish Mehrunes Dagon and form a new covenant with Akatosh. While this most certainly sealed all the Oblivion gates, it did not banish the Daedra currently in Mundus, and Skyrim is still beset by conflict, as the Nords of Skyrim face Daedric threats, both from without and from within. While the mythic Dawn has been exterminated from Cyrodiil, the Daedra worshippers in other provinces, responsible for opening the gates in alternate locations, have yet to be rooted out. Every province believes that the full might of the Imperial Legion should be deployed to their province to root out the Daedra worship, while Chancellor Okado has tried to be as accommodating as possible, every province believes that they should have more right to the troops than every other province. They look at the empire that's been ruling them for a long time, and they see a, a general lack of imperial legions coming in and cleaning up the mess. So while all the provinces are still technically a part of the empire, there is a peasantry. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, a fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? So the first order of business is to remove the world-ending crisis. There's a reason Elder Scrolls 1's adventure took 10 years according to the canon, and Elder Scrolls 2 and 3 did not have eminent threats at all. Elder Scrolls 1 had a fake emperor doing fake emperor things. The fake emperor won. He's in charge. The world is as bad as it's going to get for now. He's hidden away the seven MacGuffins, and it's your job to overcome his champions and dethrone the fake Uriel Septim. It takes you 10 years to do this because you traveled every province. Plenty of time for side quests and fun. Elder Scrolls II had a spectral army coming out of the kingdom of Daggerfall, rising only at night, killing anyone who didn't stay in their homes. This allowed the player to experience this as they saw fit, go anywhere they want during the day without a problem. Stopping the Spectral Army was something you were tasked with accomplishing, but the entire country won't just fall over and die because you wandered off for a month and did something in a different kingdom. Likewise, Elder Scrolls III doesn't even present dramatic stakes to you at all until you start learning about the Sixth House Cult and discover through the main quest the Sleepers are awakening. This is something that will take generations to become a real threat. The villain is actually waiting for you, the player, to bring him Wraithguard. Meaning that while Elder Scrolls 1 through 5, all of the game worlds wait for you, the player, Elder Scrolls 3's storyline is actually waiting for you, the player. Whether the world will end or not hinges on your confrontation with Dagathur using the Wraithguard. None of the powers that be in Elder Scrolls 3 are going to bring Wraithguard willingly to the villain. That's something you have to do, and then you have to beat him using it. So finally, we get Elder Scrolls 4 and 5, which make zero sense. Having the fate of the world on the line, depending on you. Because I've decided to spend a month just chilling out in Winterhold, raising my conjuration skill. Trollolololol. So in alternate Skyrim, we're removing the dramatic stakes until late game. Not to say that there aren't personal stakes. We want to make your journey through alternate Skyrim to be a personal one where, you know, if you live or die, that's important, right? But we're gonna dial back the prophecy knob from a 10 to a two and use the throwaway line from Elder Scrolls IV. There are grave tidings from Skyrim. The graybeards speak of the end of all time, which is an actual line that can be uttered 
between a couple NPCs during a radiant conversation in Elder Scrolls 4. At the time, we thought they were referring to the Oblivion Crisis, but let's just say that two years have passed since then. Let's say that not only have their warnings become worse, but they're extremely respected figures. Like, we'll say that the Greybeards have accurately prophesied things before. And so we're looking at this now like... The end of all time? Are you you're kidding me, right? That's that's vague and stupid, and and that is exactly the attitude ninety nine percent of the NPCs should take. Is this is this is stupid? You know, like <laughs> the end of all time. That that's not going to happen. Sorry. And so there's a prophecy going on, but nobody takes it seriously, except for possibly Chancellor Okado and. Uh, a friendly Nord who happens to be a part of the Blades faction. The Blades have been used in Elder Scrolls 2, 3, and 4, effectively acting as your main quest guides. In Elder Scrolls 2, you could choose to betray them later and side with whoever you want. In Elder Scrolls 3, they became irrelevant when the Spymaster was sent home due to riots in the Imperial City and you became the ranking officer in the Blades, led to just do what the Emperor told you to do, which is to assume the role of the prophecy. To, to make the prophecy happen. That was ultimately the Emperor's orders for you, that you learned about toward the end of the game. And by then, the Blades are no longer necessary. The training wheels are off. So in that sense, the Blades are still the perfect faction to get you into the story. And once you're in the story, it becomes a personal story. And once it becomes a personal story, you no longer need the training wheels. This is how an outsider becomes an insider. Anyway, back to the political situation of Tamriel. Without a sitting emperor, those of royal blood are now positioning themselves and their agents for an impending civil war for control of the empire. I know those of you who are saying, well, all of the Septim's heirs died. You clearly don't understand how royal families work, and neither did Bethesda. I'm going to nab a tiny bit of CGP Grey's Monarch video, which is awesome, by the way. You should totally watch this guy. Now, sometimes the branch of a family tree dies out, be it from war or plague or whatever, so the Crown's contingency plan, if it's at a dead end, is to back up one level and then apply the rules forward again, looking for a living head to sit upon. If no luck, back up again and repeat and repeat until a living heir is found. And there will always be an heir. The first King of England was over a thousand years ago. Just about every European alive is distantly related to him, so the Crown will eventually find a way. So each contender for the Imperial Throne is using the promise to bring Imperial troops to deal with the Daedric threat as a way of gathering support for their claim on the Imperial Throne from their province of origin. Without a steady flow of reinforcements, the Daedra have established strongholds in these various provinces. I would say these strongholds would be at the site of former Oblivion Gates. We'll say that the Vale of Mundus is weaker at the sites of former gates, and they're using those spots as places of power with which to summon more Daedra. Obviously, the Daedra can't summon themselves. They need to worship them and act as conduits and uh, summoners, as it were. Elder Scrolls II already established that where a tear in the veil exists, an extremely powerful summoner could, in theory, summon an army of Daedra. Let's say they accomplished that at this point because the Oblivion Crisis was the, the biggest tear in the veil, if you know what I mean. This means that recapturing these spots is vital, not just in Skyrim, but all over Tamriel. Now, this was easy in Cyrodiil because all of these places were right next to major cities, meaning that they had garrisons right there ready to stomp them. But let's say in other provinces, like the untamed wilds of Skyrim or the deep toxic marshes of Black Marsh, they had gates open a little further out in isolated places. Because they had forewarning in Black Marsh, and in Skyrim they had mighty warriors uh, who saw it as their duty to root out and destroy the gates, we didn't have to worry too much in those provinces. But in places like, say, Morrowind, or Somerset Isle, or Valenwood, or High Rock, or Hammerfell, these, these Daedric fortresses are a real problem. They're entrenched, and uh, they all want to use a, a kind of claim 
to the Imperial Throne as a way to get support in to deal with their Daedra. At least the noblemen want to use that as a vehicle to ascend the throne. It's politics on an Imperial scale. Anyway, we're going to say that while there are many contenders to the throne, the Imperial Scholars are attempting to avert an empire-wide civil war. And they've identified the next in line to the throne, who has the strongest claim, is actually the current High King of Skyrim. We can say that this man is an heir to Saint Alicia, and therefore possesses the dragon blood. Remember, there is no uh, dragon soul absorbing, foos road dying type of dragonborn in this. We're going back to classic lore, where the dragon blood makes you dragonborn. And the biggest perk of being Dragonborn is, number one, Covenant with Alicia. Number two, you're, you're kind of larger than life. You have more potential. And three, you can see more than lesser men can. So, you know, if there's a conspiracy against you, you'll, you'll probably pick up on it pretty easily. As opposed to someone who doesn't have the dragon blood, who doesn't have that, that sight. Having a great and powerful warrior king of the north... Being the next direct heir to the Empire is very compelling to some and very, very threatening to others. Now, the High King of Skyrim, from his throne in Winterhold, refuses to entertain ascending the throne, saying that Nord warriors are enough to end this Daedric invasion themselves. He, unlike the rest of the provinces, he's not asking for support from the Imperial Legions. He sees this as a challenge to his people, defeating these Daedric fortresses, making this war between the mortals and the Daedra end for good is just a duty that his people have had. It's why their people train so hard and fight so much. Summation of their warrior culture, their purpose, their reason for being made manifest. And because he doesn't want the support of the Imperials, he's not sucking up to the Empire, he says, Basically, as long as these threats exist in my lands, I will not become emperor. I will lead my people to battle as I am the warrior king. So Chancellor Okado, acting ruler of the empire, sends his agent to assist the situation in Skyrim and aid the blades. As the emperor's eyes and ears in Skyrim, noting that there's actually no sitting emperor when they, they will constantly reference the emperor, but it's actually the ruler in standing who is Akado. And it was a back and forth between the Emperor's eyes and ears and the sitting ruler, Okado, that they came to this conclusion that, hey, maybe the Greybeard's um, rumblings are more than just rumblings, but we have to assess the immediate situation and figure out if the Warrior King is actually planning anything on the sly because we don't like the idea that he's refusing this great honor. The next, like, three in line to the Imperial Throne are no good. No good. We do not want them as Emperor. We want this guy, the number one guy, the guy who's refusing it. And if you know anything about history, then the people love giving power to people who don't want power, or at least act like they don't want power. And so this would kind of play into that. We're going to peel back that Nord culture that Elder Scrolls V presented. And this is important because while Elder Scrolls V presented us with a, a Scandinavian American kind of light Viking culture where, you know, you had a bunch of farmers and shit, it was essentially Bruma, but stretched across the whole province, which was extremely disappointing. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to the culture that earlier Elder Scrolls games presented to us before Oblivion. So, in this fantasy world of Tamriel, the culture of Skyrim will be one that promotes strength. Thus, farmers learn to wield a sword at the age of six, and all but the most punsy and rich folks will have the wherewithal to at least kill a bear, or something of those lines. Banditry really doesn't pay in Skyrim, so Bandits are really reduced to kind of highwaymen or people preying on foreigners. They, they tend to stay away from the farms of Skyrim because they know that a family of farmers could probably cause them heavy losses and wouldn't be worth whatever meager bit of grain they manage to filch. 
Your average mill worker could probably wield a crossbow like a seasoned Imperial veteran. And in the middle of a pub brawl, the serving wench would probably be the last one standing. In short, previous games saw no problem with embracing the fact that this is a Dungeons and Dragons inspired fantasy world and establish certain tropes accordingly regarding Nords. These tropes are far more interesting than they were farmers and traders. Instead, they were farmers and traders who were strong warriors in their own right and only relegated to those roles because there were those even greater than them aspiring to be the warriors. Now that said, in a world where everyone is extraordinary, well then, extraordinary is just the new normal, right? So how do you anchor them to some form of realism while stepping into this land of larger-than-life, strong northerners? The answer is foreign traders, visiting noblemen, dignitaries, and most importantly, communities of immigrants, as well as Kolovians living in the south. The people who could not adapt to the Nord way of doing things. In the largest cities like Winterhold, Windhelm, Whiterun, Solitude, you'd have a melting pot of various races, and the cities would reflect that, with local politics and policies heavily favoring the resident Nords, and discriminating against those who were less physically capable, assuming uh, the rules would assume that, well, all the other races were less capable, even if the person in question was really capable. A warrior's culture creates a land where might makes right. So while there are laws that everyone follows, and therefore there's a crime system that can work, the laws are shaped by the strong. So while you have lines of kings ruling over their various city-states, hereditary rule can be challenged. So while the sons of kings are treated more harshly than your average peasant when it comes to training, they come out of it as rulers that will live long enough to have sons to inherit their thrones. Now, we'll have a stark contrast between the Colovian territories like Falkreath and uh, Riverwood, which, keep in mind, uh, classically speaking, Riverwood was its own city-state, and northern areas like Windhelm and Winterhold. For those of you who don't know, Colovians are Imperials who tend to favor more on their Nord heritage. And here up in the north, in Skyrim, the Colovians who live there would be a sterner stuff. And those people would always have a chip on their shoulder, always something to prove. While the Nords from the north would always look down on them as being not real Nords, you know, just a, a poncy Colovian. And there'd be conflict there. Not, not outright physical conflict, but a kind of social conflict. The long-lived leaders in alternate Skyrim would be scarred from years of answering challenges in court. And while in court, they should be rough, rigid, stoic figures, not showing much emotion because that's what the tradition dictates. And then we'll contrast that when you meet them out of court, say um, in a, a mead hall or something, where they will show their real personality. Sometimes they will be strong, stoic warriors to the core, and other times they'll be like, I am so sick of this stuff, man. Not in those words, but that's the, the essence of how they would act. Now in public, the words Jarl and King should be used interchangeably, depending on who's speaking. As we established in the earlier games, the use of King, besides High King, was able to be used in Skyrim. The various city-states had their own king. And the idea is you can figure out who had a traditional Nord upbringing versus who immigrated or was born and raised around a bunch of immigrants because the immigrants would call him king and the people who were born and raised in Skyrim would call him Jarl. Religious issues referenced in previous games should take stage as well. The Imperial Cult in previous games discussed the heathen Nords worshipping their false gods like Alduin. Uh, that was a thing previously, and that should come back and be front and center here, as the old gods should be more than just passing references, but rather the primary religion. 
We'll have enclaves of Imperials, Bretons, and Cyrodiil-born nerds who take a view of these backwards traditions, worshipping these primal names of the gods. And thus the Temple of Old Gods and the Imperial Cult would be mutually exclusive factions, one against the other. So, again, another important note is because there's no Dragon Crisis going on at all, the dragons aren't coming back right now. That wouldn't preclude a dragon or two, like maybe a dragon den up at one of the highest peaks. If we pay attention to the lore, dragons weren't wiped out at all. That was more or less fiction that Skyrim created as a way of making the Dragon Crisis seem like a big deal. We already know based on the lore that Imperial Dragon Riders were a thing before Elder Scrolls IV nixed all the good lore from Cyrodiil. Before Elder Scrolls IV came out as this generic husk of what it could have been. We ourselves saw the corpse of a dragon and his rider in Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire. So the result of there being no general dragon threat or dragon cult shenanigans going on, we are detaching the thume or voice from the dragons entirely. Dragon shouts simply aren't a thing at all in this universe. That does not mean the player can't learn to shout. It's just we won't be absorbing the souls of dragons and converting that directly into shouting power. That kind of power mechanic, the, the shout system, is something the game never needed. Previous games had powers, and previous lore, the Thum was always something that existed. It's just it became extremely cheesy in Elder Scrolls V, so we're going to be avoiding that. As the lore originally depicted, Markarth's side had a college, a school of the voice that would teach aspiring Nords how to shout, how to learn the way of the voice. It wasn't something relegated to the Greybeard specifically. So we're going to say that there are various monks there who exist in Markarth's side, and they kind of wear a, um, a muffle, a, like a headband except around the mouth. And that's as a reminder that they cannot speak. Because those who have trained in the voice for too many years have gotten voices that are so powerful that even regular speech would cause the area to rumble. It's something King Wolfharth himself had to deal with when instead of reading his oath of office being sworn in, he had to write his oath out and sign it because his voice was simply too powerful, it would have affected the people around him negatively. And so while the player would be given training in the voice, you would get it as a power that you could start out as worthless and it would slowly get better and better, there was always that worry that if for some reason you, you mastered it too fully, it would become a part of you and your voice would become so strong that you'd never be able to talk normally. It obviously would never happen to the player, but it would be a primary storyline element when dealing with NPCs who had mastered the voice. The voice would not be primary to the game, but it would be something that would be brought up multiple times during quest lines and things of that nature. And the player would gain the ability to get a power in order to use a shout. The shout powers that you gained access to would increase as you studied the way of the voice and we'd have trainers and it would be a fully fledged skill that you could use in the game. Now, as far as the alternate Skyrim story goes, we'd run it off a four act structure. Act one would be the remnants of the Daedric threat. In act one, you would earn your fame and agency in alternate Skyrim. You'd save the High King from betrayal within his own court and become his hand, or you would uh, watch him fall and become the hand of the one who uh, you helped do the deed. And regardless of how Act 1 turned out, Act 2 would simply have established you as someone with a certain level of influence. Not not known the world over, but the nobles certainly know that you've got this little crest that says you're, you're acting on behalf of the High King. Y you respect the crest, okay? Average peasant looks at the crest, goes, what's this thing? But the nobles know. The, the, the various kings or jarls, they, they know to respect this thing, okay? So Act 2 will have you dealing with the Greybeard's prophecy of the end of all time and unearthing a threat of an evil god from the ancient Nord Pantheon. This would get the player to understand the ancient Nord Pantheon isn't just renames of the same god, but rather uh, these long-cast shadows in the frozen north. 
and the relics and powers granted to them are very real in a certain level of mysticism, meaning that someone's trying to use these old god relics for evil purposes, and you either got to stop them or usurp them. Now, Act 3 would be the Army of the Undead. In the Seeking of the Relics, whether you successfully dealt with them or you stole them, doesn't matter. Um, the, the final prize, the final quest of that would cause an awakening. An army of the disgraced dead. You see, while the dragon cult and its lore in Skyrim is doesn't exist in alternate Skyrim, we'll go back to the original lore for the Draugr. The Draugr were the disgraced dead who were cursed to find no rest. Now, we'll be revealing a cult leader. Not the dragon cult, but a cult leader who was raising this army, releasing them from their barrows, driving them to seek revenge on the living. The player will have to delve into Nord mythology, and this will accumulate with the player finding the Horn of Sovngarde and using it to summon forth a spectral army to fight the Draugr forces. Now, the result of summoning the spectral army in has created a path to Sovngarde, through which the cause of Act 3 has now taken center stage in Act 4. And the player will have to use this bridge to travel through the afterlife into more or less Viking heaven. Hello, Sovngarde. And there will be various followers of this cult who will each try to embody and usurp the, the runic name of one of the Nord old gods, and in doing so, try to embody their power. Now, they'll only manage to embody like a fraction of that power, but the result is a climactic boss battle with these incarnations of each of the uh, old gods. Not real incarnations, mind you. They're, they're just people attempting to mantle or usurp the, the face of those gods. Anyway, the final fight in Sovngarde would be at the Throne of Shore, and you'd have to face the Avatar of Orki. He would be riding the Ghost of Alduin. If you've ever read the Five Songs of Wolfharth, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But yeah, the Avatar of Orki would be at the Throne of Shore, riding the Ghost of Alduin, and you would have to more or less do what they were doing with the various old gods, but you would have to embody Shore to a certain extent in order to face the Ghost of Alduin. And in banishing the Ghost of Alduin, you have one last climactic battle with the Avatar of Orki, banishing him for good and thereby freeing Viking Heaven, aka Sovngarde, from his control. This causes the Tide of the Dead that started in Act 3 to end, and Skyrim can go back to normal. Returning from Sovngarde, you'd be free to do as you pleased, but because much of this happened in another dimension, you're really only known as one of the heroes, one of the heroes, who fought the army of the Draugr. Now, this threat is localized to Greater Skyrim, and you'll find that until you specifically do something in late Act 2, Act 3 won't start. In other words, there will be no consequences for you just screwing around in the beginning. And dramatic stakes only start building as your investment in the plot builds. In other words, by the time you have fully committed yourself to doing the main quest, that's when the stakes are real. But until then, you don't have to worry. You're not going to be told an hour into the game that the end times are here. Thanks, Greybeards. Now, the Greybeards obviously would have a presence, but they would, again, not be listened to. And even then, you had a hand in making that threat a reality. Now, as for the threat itself, it's important to understand that it was localized to Greater Skyrim. In the beginning, the crux of the storyline is who's going to rule over Skyrim. And then, later on, when the undead come out, it will be for them to try to lay claim over their ancestral lands. This land belongs to the dead. Let the living forever shun this place. Something of that nature. Even at the climax of the story, 
Skyrim and the Nord Afterlife are the only things at risk, not the rest of the world. If the hero fails in their quest and the forces of evil do prevail, then the rest of the world will shrug and keep on going. Because good doesn't always triumph over evil. And we need stakes in line with that. So, assuming the hero did fall and, the in and all of Skyrim went to crap, you would hear about it in a different game, Elder Scrolls VI. Yes, we hear that the hero fell and that Skyrim is a dead land. Yes, we have quite a few Nord refugees. Having lost their homeland, it's... It's pretty bad. Things of that nature. I'm not saying you should have a bad ending. Certainly not. The whole point of a fantasy is to to rise up and, and conquer the forces that oppose you. However, despite that, the, the concept of failure needs to be conceivable. Because if failure isn't conceivable and the world can't go on, with your failure, it means that a certain level of dramatic stakes have been pulled away. Because now your failure is inconceivable. The world ends if you fail, so I mean, it's really do or die time. You know, just throw out all uh, ideas of uh, what happens if you die, because the answer is it's all over. In that sense, I find that dramatic tension actually builds when you know that life could continue to go on with a suboptimal outcome as opposed to just ending so in that sense the graybeard's prophecy about the end of all time not being exactly accurate makes it far more interesting and realizing exactly what that prophecy meant might not be so straightforward. Instead of just going, well, this has all been planned out for me. I'm just gonna follow God's path and I will never go astray. No, that, that's boring. Let's just say that Elder Scrolls V didn't live up to its full potential in my eyes. Ignore everything I just said about alternate Skyrim. Forget about alternate Skyrim. Instead, and let's just say instead of creating that time skip and say, well, Morrowind exploded, and everything changed when the Fire Nation, I mean the Aldmeri Dominion, attacked. And now Talos Worship is banned. Which, it, it, that's what they did in Elder Scrolls V. Instead of the time skip, they could have made these events occur in real time around the player. We could have experienced a Talos Worshipping culture in the beginning, and suddenly, one of your primary gods is now banned. Let, let's let's actually have Talos do something for you. Because, you know, the, the gods in Elder Scrolls, they actually do send relics and aspects and avatars in the storyline. Elder Scrolls 3, for example, has a couple aspects. Talos, Mara, and Zenithar actually are in the game. So, understanding that, you could have had Talos actually help you at some point via a relic or whatever and now you're forced to denounce talos or have to face the imperials who are enforcing this law see how making it happen to the player is a lot more impactful than just saying it happened in the past even if it doesn't happen to the player necessarily we could have aldmeri agents trying to root out and expose npcs you met earlier for heresy you could have npcs coming to you saying we need to do something about this i've seen your strength Let's put an end to this farce. And you could become a part of a revolution against this, or you could turn them in. I'm generally annoyed at the concept of show don't tell because there are many, many times that it is a great and valid thing to use expositional dialogue that informs the reader, or in this case, the player about things. They would have had no way of having this information given to them organically. History books are definitely a completely valid method of storytelling as our narration. But in this particular case, it's lazy and it robs the player of the storytelling potential. The power that Elder Scrolls games have is a 3D first person role playing like action series. In my opinion, the third era was the best era for storytelling. 
as the Empire was the perfect vehicle for creating an anchor of familiarity in an alien world, in any kind of foreign place. You could have the Empire as that line of familiarity that'll keep you anchored. So, you know, this the strange Telvanni customs only appear strange because there are people who don't participate in them. It's like when I was talking about alternate Skyrim and I was telling you about the Kolovians or the, the immigrants and things like that and how they are not the big, larger-than-life warrior Nords. It's, it's how you can tell the difference by having that anchor existing in a world that is fantastical. And the Empire acts as that anchor. I would say if the Elder Scrolls series has committed any sins at all, it's making the game worlds too condensed. The play area, that is Skyrim, covers too much geographical space despite it being too small. In other words, it robs the potential of the Elder Scrolls to tell interesting new stories and interesting new locations. Instead, we get kind of the, the same homogenized, bland culture spread across the entire province. I mentioned this earlier, Skyrim, Elder Scrolls V that is, is very much just Bruma spread across the entire province. It's unfortunate. For everything being handcrafted, Elder Scrolls V really misses the point of doing that. And there you have it, my explanation as to why I say Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, quite frankly didn't live up to its potential because there were so many other paths it could have taken that were far better than having sky lizards flying around bugging you every 20 minutes. And a story that reduces the most interesting parts of Nord lore down to offhanded references. Thank you all for watching. Check the links on screen for more content. And I'm going to be talking about other stuff next time. Y'all have a good one now.